So based on the previous two videos, what we should see now is that when we deal with real signals, or what I call practical signals, that are time-limited, this means that they are going to have kind of this infinite frequency extent. When we plot their Fourier transform in the frequency domain, there isn't going to be a spot where their frequency content goes to zero and stays zero for forever. They are going to have frequency content that just continues for forever, which means the max frequency is infinite, which means that I need to sample at two times infinity, which is infinity, and that really no sampling rate is high enough. So that is obviously is a problem. So I can't sample at infinity. So if I sample at something less than that, I'm gonna run into a problem. And the problem is going to be everything above my sampling frequency divided by two is going to fold over or what's called alias to a different frequency. So let's take a look at kind of a picture of what happens when I sample a signal that has a large frequency extent at something less than that max frequency. So here is a little cartoon of what I was saying. Let's say that we have some spectrum here in blue. So look at the blue curve. That's what I call the original spectrum. And just like in the MATLAB script, the frequency content just keeps going and going and going. Now it decays and gets pretty small, but it never actually goes to zero. It's getting smaller and smaller, but it never actually goes to zero. So let's think about what happens if I was to sample in the time domain this signal that has this spectrum in the frequency domain. We know what happens if I sample at a rate of fs. This original spectrum, this blue curve, gets shifted at increments of fs. So we get a copy right here at fs, we get a copy at minus fs, we get a copy at minus 2 fs, plus 2 fs. So we get replications of the original spectrum at multiples of fs all up and down the frequency axis. The spectrum of the overall sampled signal is the sum of all of these curves. So if you pick the point, say there, the spectrum of the sampled signal is really this red curve plus this blue curve plus this red curve that's over here, plus this red curve that's over here. There's actually an infinite number of curves right there, all overlapping, that I need to add up. And when I add them up, I end up getting this black curve right here. So that is what the black curve is. The black curve represents the spectrum of the sampled signal. And really, at every point on the frequency axis, there is the original spectrum and all these copies that I have to add up to get to this black curve. Now, most of those curves, like this one, by the time they get over here, they're very small, but they're still non-zero. They still add up. And when they add up, that introduce what's called aliasing. These frequencies up here have kind of folded down, and they're pretending to be a frequency down here, and they've messed up the spectrum of my original signal. I no longer have the original spectrum right here. I have this black curve, which matches pretty closely, but pulls away and doesn't match at all. So that's a problem. What would happen if I had sampled my signal like this and then tried to go back to the original signal? Well, we know how to go back to the original signal. We know how to put in this reconstruction filter to eliminate everything above fs over 2 and everything below minus fs over 2. That's what we call the ideal reconstruction filter. Well, look what I'm going to get back. My original spectrum was this blue line. When I go back and recover my signal, I'm going to recover the black line. That was the spectrum of the sampled signal. So what I actually get back, what I actually get back is this black line right here. And notice some important things about this. This black line, which is the spectrum of our reconstructed signal, which we would hope would match exactly our original signal, right? That's kind of the game we're doing right here. Start off with a signal, sample it, reconstruct it, get back to where we started. We don't get back to where we started. We get back to this black curve, which is a little bit different than this blue curve. So a few different things have happened. So first of all, we have this distortion right in here where the black curve doesn't match the blue curve. And that's this distortion due to what we call folding of frequencies or aliasing. All of these frequencies that were up here that folded down, distorted things to where we don't get back to where we started. So that's one type of distortion that's been introduced here due to aliasing. There's another distortion that's present though too. My original signal actually had frequencies above fs over 2 that went out for forever. 
But I essentially just threw those away. Once I said, I'm going to sample an FS, I said everything above FS over 2 is kind of outside my world. I, I can't deal with it. So these frequencies, which were present in the original signal, are gone. I have lost them. So we've actually kind of introduced two types of distortion here. Not really introduced it, but practical signals have infinite frequency extent. When I sample them, I'm going to have some distortions. And these are the types of distortions that we're going to encounter. So let's talk about maybe a smarter thing to do when dealing with real world signals. There is at least one thing I can do to help out with one of these types of distortions, and that's use what's called an anti-aliasing filter. The idea of this filter is if I'm going to sample at fs, then I know that my world is kind of everything between minus fs over 2 to fs over 2. Anything above fs over 2 I know is going to fold down an alias when I sample. So the job of the anti-aliasing filter is to remove those frequencies. So before I filter, or before I sample, I'm going to get rid of all frequencies above fs over 2. So when I sample, they can't alias down. Another way of thinking about an anti-aliasing filter is really what we're doing is we're going to limit the signal to what we call its effective bandwidth. On the previous charts, even though that signal that I sketched in the frequency domain had frequency content from minus infinity to infinity, at some point the frequency content had kind of rolled off and the spectrum had gotten really small. Well, once it's rolled off to kind of a small enough number, we'll call that the effective bandwidth of the signal. And let's sample at a rate and let's limit the frequencies with our anti-aliasing filter to that effective bandwidth. So here's kind of a block diagram of our new sampling process. Given some signal x of t that I want to sample at a rate fs, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run it through an anti-aliasing filter to chop off all the frequencies whose magnitude is greater than fs over 2. That's what I called xaa. I now have a kind of an ideal low-pass filtered signal. And it's this signal now that I'm going to perform impulse sampling on by multiplying it by my impulse train. And that is going to result in my impulse sampled signal that had previously been filtered with an anti-aliasing filter. A few things about this, a few things that, that are important to note. When I think about this anti-aliasing filter that's going to chop off all the frequencies above fs over 2, I am definitely picturing in my mind an ideal low-pass filter. Well, we know that an ideal anti-aliasing filter does not exist because it's non-causal. So again, we're kind of back into the theory world. But we can design filters that are pretty close to that that are causal. Also, note that what we're doing here is basically saying, I'm going to go ahead and lose on one type of distortion. I'm not going to lose with aliasing. I'm going to prevent aliasing from occurring, because that's the whole goal of the anti-aliasing filter. But by using an anti-aliasing filter, I am pre-introducing distortions. I am throwing away sig signal content right here off the bat. I know that my signal has frequency content above fs over 2, but my anti-aliasing filter is going to throw it away. So it's gone. This is where, as engineers, we have to be smart about what we think the effective bandwidth is. If I can have a high enough sample rate and I can have a much larger bandwidth, what I throw away could be pretty small, and that would be ideal. So we have to use some judgment here on what the effective bandwidth is, but we are, off the bat, changing the signal before sampling it, and that is something important to keep in mind. All right, so now let's take a look at what would happen kind of with a cartoon if I was to do an anti-aliasing filter before sampling. So kind of back to the, our kind of Gaussian spectrum. My original spectrum is this blue curve right here. And I'm going to sample the signal that corresponds to that frequency domain spectrum. Before sampling, though, I'm going to run it through an anti-aliasing filter. So here's my anti-aliasing filter. It has a perfect ideal low-pass filter response that rejects everything above fs over 2 and everything below minus fs over 2. So after I've thrown these frequencies away, the spectrum is just really just this black part right here. Okay? After I do impulse sampling, we know what happens. This black part is now going to be replicated up and down at multiples of fs. So there's a copy of it here at fs, a copy at minus fs, a copy at minus 2 fs, a copy at plus 2 fs, all up and down. However, since we chopped off this tail, the tail that used to be right here is no longer there. 
we have prevented aliasing from occurring by using our anti-aliasing filter. So look at this. The spectrum of my sampled signal now lies right on top of the spectrum of my original signal. This black curve and this blue curve are right on top of each other. Now, I did lose all of this frequency content. That was something we said we were gonna do. That was the loss we were gonna take. Off the bat, we're gonna toss it. So this distortion is still present. That original signal actually had these frequencies and we threw them away. That's a loss. However, by throwing them away, we prevented them from folding back down and distorting things right here. So previously, before using the anti-aliasing filter, we had two types of distortion. We lost these frequencies and we had aliasing. Using the anti-aliasing filter, we still lose some frequencies, but we no longer have aliasing right here. So in general, I think this is a better thing to do. It only has one type of distortion and we get to control this. If we were to increase FS, I would throw away less and less frequencies and maybe I would let more of these in. So as the engineers, we're now in much better control of what's happening and this is a much better way to do things. All right, so that concludes this little section on time-limited signals. It's a very practical thing to think about when dealing with real-world signals things that you have to do when sampling real world signals. In the next videos, we'll look at our next kind of practical consideration, and that is the consideration that we don't have an impulse train in the real world. It's very nice to work the math with an ideal impulse train, but we cannot create impulses in the real world. So are there other things that we can do to sample signals when we don't have an ideal impulse train?